All right, let's take our Bibles and 2 Chronicles chapter 34. Thank you, Brother John, for reading that for us. Good singing this morning. Are you glad you're washed in the blood? Amen. There is a fountain filled with blood. Hallelujah. Never loses its power. Glory to God for that. Second Chronicles chapter 34. Now, my, uh, my goal for this month is going to preach through the life of Josiah. All right. And how that revival can come through a godly leader. Now, when I talk about a godly leader, I am talking to uh, you men who are husbands and fathers. I'm talking to single ladies who are, you know, bringing up children on their own, if there's any here doing that. Uh, so I'm not necessarily talking about godly leadership as far as uh, Scott Morrison. Uh, the jury's out for me still yet as to whether he is a truly saved and born again believer. I uh, have not heard his testimony, but um, uh, anyway, I won't we'll keep politics out of the pulpit this morning. Um, but I'm not necessarily talking about a prime minister or a, a president. I'm talking about I'm talking about you as an individual, as men and ladies. I'm talking about even revival from the pulpit through preachers. I'm talking about godly leadership that will bring revival. Now, when we think about revival, we think about, as we were saying in the adult Bible class, we're talking about, and I, and I thought about this during the week in Romans chapter 6, talking about baptisms, we're having baptisms a bit later, that you're buried in the likeness of his death and you're raised to walk in newness of life. Mm -hmm. And how many of you remember when you first got saved, you were baptised, how exciting it was, the newness of life, everything had changed and it was just a wonderful time in our life and it was fresh, it was exciting. And I know everyone has different experiences, but we, we talked about revivals bringing back the newness of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, God wants to bring revival. I have no doubt about that. The Bible tells us that God is the orchestrator of revival. Revival can come through him. Revival comes through his word. Mm -hmm. Now, that's why it's important for you as Christians to be in the word every day. We talked about being prosperous by meditating in the word night and day. Hey, it's good to listen to preaching through the week. I listen to some great messages during the week and I thank God for the internet and the things that we can listen to online. Be very careful though who you listen to online, but it's good to be able to have that. And really my heart, this is my heart, and I shared this this morning, you know, the, the importance of assembling together isn't to have backsides on seats and just to have a big crowd. I mean, if we want to have a big crowd, we would change a lot of the ways that we do things just to attract a crowd. But the whole, the whole burden that I have, the reason why I want people in church is to be under the sound of the preaching of the Word of God because I know without doubt that revival comes through the Word of God. So when you're in it at home, what a blessing that is. And if you're not in it at home, then you've got a chance every Sunday, Lord willing, when you come to church to get under the sound of the preaching of the word. And we'll see what Jesus said about his word. He says, my word, they are spirit and they are life. All right. And he says, it says it's the spirit that quickeneth, he said. So we understand that God is, is able and capable and willing to bring revival. It's, it's whether we want the revival or not. It's where, and listen, God, is, God will raise people up to, to do just that. He will raise someone up in a home. He will raise someone up uh, in, in the church to, to set them on fire and, and prayerfully and hopefully through that person, that family member, that part, whoever it is, that person in the church through that, then God wants to have that revival sweeping through that his people may enjoy the newness of life again. Uh, how many of us have been through a bushfire? Anyone been through a bushfire before? We, we've been through a couple when we, were in, well, when we were in Perth. We went through one and then not far from us. Remember, it was a couple of years ago, not far from yeah. us. You know, when fire sweeps through, what happens after the fire is gone? It starts regenerating new growth, doesn't it? New life starts popping up everywhere. And so the, one of the reasons why God wants to bring revival into our hearts is to... Uh, you're right, everyone okay? All right, we're all settled. All right, one reason why God wants to bring revival into our hearts is to so-called burn up all the rubbish in our life to bring about new life. All right, new life, new life in Christ. So here we're introduced to a young man by the name of Josiah. 
Now, Josiah took the throne when he was how old? Eight. Eight years old. He was a child when he took the throne. Now, he took over after a number of years of bad leadership amongst Judah. His father, Manasseh, was a bad leader. His grandfather was a bad leader. And uh, we see that, that, that Judah, in particular Israel as well, all of God's people were struggling. They were, they were an idolatrous nation. They had, by the way, the idolatry began with Solomon. I mean... Crazy man. How many wives and concubines? I mean, 700 wives, 300 concubines. And it was, sorry ladies, it was the women that turned his heart away from God to follow false gods. And through, now the wisest man in the world, apart from Jesus Christ, through that, Israel, God's people started down the slippery slope of idolatry. Who remembers King Ahab? Remember Ahab, he married Jezebel, who was the, the daughter of one of the priests of Baal. Now, don't tell me she, uh, she led Ahab in a good direction. No way. As a matter of fact, there is nothing ever good said about Jezebel. That's why we don't call our daughters Jezebel. How many children have you known? How many ladies have you known that's had a daughter? And it's like, oh, what's your daughter's name? I've just decided to call her Jezebel. <laughs> Uh, not too many, not too many, and not too many boys called Judas, by the way. What's your son's name? Oh, we decided to call him Judas. Oh, that's an interesting name. What'd you call him Judas for? Well, we haven't got high hopes for him. But, you know, nobody calls their kids Judas or Jezebel. Why is that? Because of the connotations associated with that. So God raises up a young boy by the name of Josiah. He takes the throne at, the, at eight years, about well, eight years later when he's 16. He starts doing something that's very important. Have a look at verse number two. It says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. Now what's the next word? For. So this is the reason why he declined neither to the right or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. That is the most important thing that anyone could ever do. That is to seek after the God of the Bible when he was 16. All right. Notice he didn't go to the left hand or to the right hand. So all, verse 1 and 2 really is a brief bio of his life. So, so throughout his life, and unfortunately we have to, we'll, we'll mention it, the last message is dealing with his fall. So it's unfortunate that this great leader fell. But anyway, it's the truth. But his whole life, he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't to the far left and he didn't go to the far right. So if he wasn't left or right, he was right in the middle. He was balanced, wasn't he? He was a balanced man. Why was he a balanced man or why was he a balanced Christian? Because he sought God. I'm going to bring politics into it. I'm sorry. Listen, if Scott Morrison... If Scott Morrison doesn't want to lean to the far left of the, of the loony bin, and if he doesn't want to go to the far right of the radicals and he wants to stay balanced, do you know what our Prime Minister needs to do? He needs to seek God. He needs to seek God. Don't worry about all the other Fruit Loops that are in Parliament, but Scott Morrison as the leader, and by the way, we, we basically know he's just the uh, front man. You know, it's the, it's, the part, it's the party that he associates that really does all the right. But listen, if Scott Morrison is going to be a true leader and he's going to be balanced and he's going to go straight down the line, then we ought to pray that this prime minister seeks God. Amen. So Josiah was a man, a young man at the age of 16. He began to seek the Lord God of his father, David. What a blessing that is. And by the way, Jeremiah was the main prophet in his life. So I believe also that the part of seeking God was also listening to the prophet. What did the prophet have to say? Now, you read about the life of Jeremiah. There weren't too many people that followed what the prophet had to say. And that's an unfortunate thing. But Josiah did. Josiah was a good, godly leader. And so God raises up a person at the right time to bring about revival within the nation. Right within God's people. Now, God may raise someone up in your household. Listen, God may don't and don't laugh at this. But how old's how old's Gracie? Three and a half. 
Who's to say that God can't touch a three and a half or a or a however old the boys are, you know what I mean? Who's to say that God can't touch the life of a young boy like Josiah and use a young child to bring about a revival? Already they're singing songs. I heard it on uh, Jeff showed me the other day. She's singing Psalm 18. I will call upon the Lord. A young child. You know, some sometimes children have got more brains than us adults. I mean, they just love the Lord and they just, there's no inhibitions. They'll sing it, they'll dance around, they'll do all this sort of stuff. And we're looking, what's going on, crazy child? Hey, listen, listen, the love of God, you know what I mean? She's been touched by the song and she sings it at home, doesn't she? I saw it putting that bed together and she's singing and even gets dad to dance on the, what was it, that plastic, the bubble wrap or something like that or whatever it was and, and she's dad dance with me on that and she's singing oh, I will call upon and dad's got to sing and dance along with it <laughs> hey we, we laugh at that that's cute but that, that's God God can use children in our lives to bring about a revival why because sometimes you can't get through to us adults because we're a little bit hard headed aren't we can't get in there so so god raises up this josiah to bring about a revival but before revival could come in and this is the title of the message we need to remove the roadblocks to revival you need to remove the roadblocks because there was a massive problem within with amongst god's people namely idolatry now just stop and think for a minute and you might think, well, hang on a second, idolatry, righto, um, carved images, statues, and all that. Oh, I don't have any of those things. No, you might not have any of those things in your life, but Australians and Australian Christians do have idols. And we'll look at some verses in a minute where those idols may not be seen. Those idols are in the, the secret parts of the heart, in the places that men can't see, but God can. And so before we even think about, man, you know, right, God says, okay, I want to bring revival, but there's some things that need to be removed. And this is where godly leadership comes in. Now, listen to me carefully. God, God will raise people up to come in and start purging what needs to be purged. My kids often laugh at me because there was a time where we went through our DVD collection. Who's got a DVD collection? Anyone got a DVD collection? Some might not want to put up their hand, I've got a DVD collection. But there have been times where I've gone through the DVD collection and purged some stuff in there. How about the music collection? How about the music collection? Is there anything in that collection that you have that doesn't glorify and magnify the Lord? If there's stuff in our lives that don't glorify and magnify the Lord, then it's glorifying and magnifying something else. And that's an issue in the life of God's people. And those things need to be purged and got rid of. At the age of 20, now get this, at the age of 20, in his 12th year, when he was 20 years old, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem. Not a popular thing, folks. Not a popular thing. Don't you mess with my idols. Don't you mess with my sacred cows. Don't you, don't you touch the things that I love. We, we, listen, we've got the high places and, and, and we've got the groves and we've got all those sorts of things. Who can remember when, uh, when Moses was up on the mountain, right, in the presence of God and Aaron's down in the, in the valley there and the person said, hey, Aaron, get up and make us a God. All right, you give us all the gold and everything. And uh, they, what did he do? He made a golden calf and they're all dancing around naked, woohoo, worshipping the wrong thing. Moses comes down and says, what's going on here? Oh, the people made me do it. <laughs> That's weak, gutless leadership. He should have said, no, I'm not doing that. Oh, where's the man of God? Where's the man of God? He's gone and left us. And this is why people need shepherding. Listen, this is why people need a shepherd. We know there's Jesus. He's the, the, the great shepherd of the sheep. But the reason why the Lord Jesus Christ sets up under shepherds, sets up people, is because people need shepherding. They need, they need direction in life. The moment you take the leader or the shepherd out, sheep wander everywhere. And let me just say something, man. If you and I are not going to be the leaders in our home, guess what's going to happen? Our families will wander everywhere. And start bringing things into the home that's going to affect the home. And we're kidding ourselves if we're going to expect revival and we're not going to purge some things in our lives. 
So God raises up this young man by the name of Josiah, who at the, 20, at the age of 20 goes and he starts purging all of Judah. I want to give you just a few things, all right, because we've got a baptism. and I just want to give you a few things, a few important things from this passage. And we've already mentioned some of it. Look at verse number three again. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And then he goes on. Here's, here's one of the most important things that, that you, now look, every Christian should do this. Every Christian should do this. But in particular, mums and dads, husbands, uh, ladies, you need to spend time with God. I mean, you've got to spend time with God. I, I don't want to get, to, I, I really want to get to the second point, but I'll, I'll stop here for a little bit. You've got to spend time with God. He's, Josiah, at the age of 16, spent time with God. And for four years, from 16 to 20, from, for four years, he sought God. Lord, what do you want? Lord, I'm coming before you. Father, what's going on? And I believe in that four-year period, God starts unfolding and revealing what he needs to do amongst God's people. And so therefore, what do we need to do? We need to spend time with God. I want to ask you a question. How much time did you spend with God this week? How much time? And, and then we wonder why, man, my life is not black. What's going on? It's like I'm having all this hardship. I'm having all these problems and, and everything. And I just, hey, listen, you can only run so long on your own wisdom. You're going to get wisdom from God when you spend time with God. But majority of God's people are not spending time. With them. That's why I shared this morning, like in our house, if you weren't here in the adult Bible class, forgive me if you were. Let me just go over this. Um, this, is, this is why I said this one. In our household in the morning, it's like gone are, gone are the days where I could get up at six o'clock or whatever it is and, and nobody stirs and you've got that quiet time and all of that. Now I get up at six, the pup's there, I've got to look after the dog, I've got to feed the dog, I've got to put him out, the dog wants to do this, dog wants, and then Carly or Megan will get up for work and then Robbie's up for work and then Tracy gets up and the young boy that we look after comes in and it's like, it, it started robbing me of my time with God. The most important thing that any Christian can do, apart from anything else, is spend time with the one who loved you and saved you. Amen. So I, this is what I've started to do. I just jump in the van, I take my Bible, my, my notepad, I call into a cafe over here, I get a takeaway coffee, I go to La Bolsa Park, I set up my deck chair under a nice big tree, I look out over the, uh, the, the uh, harbour there with all the boats, and I spend time with God, and it is no kids, no dog, no wonderful wife. <laughs> Just me, my Bible, my coffee and the Lord. And I get to meditate and I pray. And I don't know how you pray. I just sometimes talk to the Lord as if he's right there. You know what I mean? I mean, he is. Hello, he's right there. Just talk to the Lord. And, and, and you know what? It's amazing when it's just you and God, what he starts sharing and revealing to you. So spending time with God, there has to come a time in your life where your conviction must be, I've got to seek God. I've got to seek God. We seek everything else but God sometimes. And this is a, this is a blocking, this is a problem when God wants to bring revival. He says, hey, I want to bring revival, but listen, you've got just too much going on in your life. You've got so much going on. Where am I in the scheme of things? Where is God in the scheme of things when it comes to your life? You know, God is seeking men and women. God is seeking men and women who are seeking him. Let me read this verse to you in Ezekiel 22, verse 30. He says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I found, what a sad ending to that verse is. I'm looking, but I couldn't find anybody. I couldn't find a man that was willing to stand in the gap. And by the way, God would not have, listen, God would not have taken his people into captivity for seven years if he could find one man to stand in the gap and pray and seek God. That's what he says, but I couldn't find any. Why? You know why? Because sometimes we're so busy seeking everything else. We're running left, right, and center, all over the place except going to the one that we need to go to the most. And that is God himself. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. 
Hmm. Now, I don't want to tread on toes here. But I'm amazed at the age group that there are some... Oh, anyway. Oh. <laughs> I, I just, I want to be kind. And it might be just me. But I'm just amazed at how many young men are just like spending all their time playing games. Honestly, there's more to life than playing games. And if my son, I've told my son, he's 20 and it's like he's, he plays his games all the time. As soon as he comes home from work, where is he? And you can hear the thing going. <laughs> Playing all this sort of stuff. Fortnite's one of the things he plays. <gasps> oh. But when I put away childish things, when I become a man, I put away childish things. Do you know that the age group, when, when, when back in the, in the day, in the, when around the world wars of one and two, there were 16 year old, 17 and 18 year old boys going off to war. That's the, that's the caliber of the type of men that we had back in the day. And now what have we got? We've got the same type of age group sitting there playing wars on the game. Like, and they've got the... All this sort of stuff. Hey, when I become a man, I put away childish things. And God's looking for mature minded men who are looking for him and he's looking for them. And he wants to raise up men and women to bring revival amongst his people. But he can't find anybody. Why? Because we're too busy with other stuff. Too busy doing other things. I'll give God five minutes of my time. Hmm? <clears throat> well, hey, if we want to have revival, then we need to spend time with God. And I'm talking about not just five minutes. I'm talking about spending time with God. It requires turning the TV off. It requires putting some other things to one side. Who's more important in your life today? You know, who's more important in your life? I mean, Jesus just died on the cross to give you eternal life. Isn't he or shouldn't he be the most important person in our life? I was going to write this. It was Tracy's birthday the other day. I was going to write this in her card. I was going to put the love of my life. And then I was going to put like a pause. Jesus. Then I was going to put Jesus first, but you definitely come before the pup. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know? I didn't. For, for uh, posterity reasons. <laughs> I wanted to be here today, you know what I mean? If I'd done that crazy, but in my sleep, she'll... <laughs> but you know, we think of our wives, don't we, man? I mean, our wives are very important to us. And ladies, I hope your husbands are very important to you. But let me just say this, and I've said this before, my wife, Tracy, is not more important than my saviour, Jesus. Now, when Jesus is, is the most important person in my life, then my relationship with my wife is going to be good. All right? And the same with my children. All right? But Jesus, we sing it first, J-O-Y. Jesus first, yourself last, others in between. But unfortunately, Jesus is not first. We live in a society where self is always number one. We live in the selfish society. We, we mentioned that before. So what was the problem? What was the problem? Here's the, here's the problem that Israel or the, the people of God had. Listen to this. There was no room for the real God in their life. There was no room for the real God. Why is that? Well, look at verse number four. And it, we've already mentioned about the groves and the carved images, the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence. The images that now you can imagine this. He's 20 years old and he's destroying everything that the people know. He's destroying everything that they love. It says, and the images that were on high above them, he cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images, he break in pieces and made dust of them, strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed. Can you imagine that? Ground it into dust, went to the graveside and went, ah, there, have that. That's your God. Yeah, and people are watching this and they're like, wow, what's going on here? Well, I tell you what's happened. God's just raised up a man to bring some revival to his people. Verse 5, and he burnt the bones of the priests upon the altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim, Simeon, even unto Naphtali with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and he had beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. He didn't stop until he had finished. He went right through and cleansed the lot. 
Why? Because there was no room for the real God. Why was that? Because they had other things in their life. Listen, if God raises you, if God speaks to your heart today and he says, listen, you've got some things in your life and because there's some things in your life, there's no room for me. You need to cleanse that stuff. You need to purge that stuff. If God speaks to your heart and says there's some things in your household that need purging, that need get rid of, let me just say this, don't stop until it's all gone. Why is that? Because God wants to bring revival. God wants to revive you and he wants to revive me. This has been an ongoing problem, as I said before, since the time of Solomon. Intensifying when Ahab marries Jezebel, the daughter of the priest of Baal. And these were hindrances or roadblocks to revival in their life. Have you any room for Jesus? You know, the songwriter says, have you any room for Jesus? He who bore your load of sin? Well, I'm a Christian. That's not the question. The question is not, are you a Christian today? The question is, as you as a Christian, do you have room for Jesus? Well, yeah, a little bit. Well, I'm glad you're honest. <laughs> well, listen, let me, let me just say this. Jesus doesn't want to have shared accommodation. Do you get that? He doesn't want to have shared accommodation. In other words, he doesn't want... He, man, he has every right to be jealous, doesn't he? Come on, someone help. He is a jealous God. Why is that? Because he purchased you. You are his. And he doesn't want to share you with everything else in this, that this life's got God. But unfortunately, we've got so much in our life that we just give God lip service. We spoke about a verse while we were out door knocking. You know, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. He says, he says you know, you, you, worship, you worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Yeah. Hey, listen, that's a picture of a lot of Christians today, folks. You worship me with your lips. You, you say all the right things, but your heart is far from me. And if our heart, hey, we know how to play church, don't we? We know how to come to church and we, know, we can, you know, we, look, we can look nice. You don't have to wear a suit to look nice. You all look really nice this morning and, and uh, you know, you're here in your place and, you know, you've got your Bible and we sang some songs. But do you know what? We can do that with the lips and not with the heart. I've used my testimony time and time again. I went to church for years. And gave lip service, but my heart was far from the Lord. Why? Well, I had room for a lot of other things, but not much room for Jesus, the one that saved me. You know, Megan and I, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 2, if you would. Luke chapter 2. Megan and I were coming to church this morning, and normally on a Sunday night, I, I call into Zarafas there at Karamundi and get a coffee. I did it this morning. And uh, I was thinking about this thought, have you any room for Jesus? And we, we drove in and I ordered my coffee and I went to the little the booth and I had a gospel track. And I said to the lady, I said, do you have any room for Jesus? She said, oh, yes, I've got room for Jesus. So I gave her a gospel track. I wanted to be a witness to her. We wanted to be a witness to her. Listen, you know, fact of the matter is, is that forget the unsaved. What about the saved person? Do you have room for Jesus? Or is your, is your life filled with so many things that Jesus, like in, in Revelation chapter 3, he's, hey, hey, I want to come in and fellowship. Hello, I want to get in there. And it's like we can't. It's like we've got so many other things. We've got the noise of everything drowning out Jesus. And all he wants to do is have fellowship and grow in intimacy with each other. And yet we're filled up with so many different things. Well, Jesus wants to have you and have you holy and solely. Have a look at this, Luke chapter 2, talking about the birth of Christ. Verse number 1, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Folks, it was a busy time. This was a big event. Get that? It was a big event. Verse 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Why? Because there was no room for them in the inn. There was no room. The innkeeper said, we don't have room for you. We don't have room for Jesus. But this same innkeeper had room for everybody else, had rooms for his family, had room for his friends, 
had room for all the event that was going on. And you know what? I thought about that and I thought, you know what? That is a picture of Christianity today. We make room for our friends. We make room for our family. We make room for, for great events that are going on in the world. And we go and support all the worldly things. And yet some of us can't even be bothered turning up for church. Have you any room for Jesus? He who bore your load of sin? Got room for everything else but Jesus Christ. And we expect revival. Listen, we won't have revival unless we first remove the roadblocks that are in our life. Have a look at Ezekiel chapter 8, if you would. Ezekiel chapter 8. <clears throat> we might not, as I said, we might not have the wood and the stone. But what about the other things? Ezekiel chapter 8. Look at verse number 12. Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse number 12. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chamber of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. Did you, did you, did you get that? Did you hear what he said? Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of Israel, the house of Israel, do in the dark? Every man in the chamber of his imagery. Do you see that? See, it doesn't matter what you... Listen, we might be able to hide things in the daytime. We can hide things from each other. All right? Ezekiel chapter 8, verse number 12. But here's the thing. It's, it's, in, the, it's in the dark, what we do in the dark. In the imagery of our mind. Huh? When people don't... What people can't see... It's what you do there that God sees that. I want you to have a look at chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 14. Look at verse number 3. Verse number 2, sorry. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? You see that? Do you know why sometimes you don't get your, answer, your prayers answered? Do you know why sometimes why, why, why you just, when you're talking to God, it feels like that the, the heaven is brass and, and things are... Because God is not listening. Why is that? Because you've got idolatry in your heart. And by the way, Colossians says that covetousness is as the sin of idolatry. Covetousness. When, when, you, when you want something so badly more than Jesus himself, he says that's covetousness. These men have set up idols in their heart. Hey, I can't see your heart, but do you know there is one that can? His name is God. He sees the heart. But you know what he does? He uses the prophets to come in and preach and say, listen, you need to get some things right in your life. There, you've got something going on in your heart. You need to get rid of that because it's a stumbling block in your life. It's iniquity. And you expect God to be inquired of you while you've got things in your heart that are not right. We're kidding ourselves. If God is there that wants to bring revival, but it's like there's no room. Your imagination is filled with other things. That you can't meditate on the things of God. Your heart is filled with other things. That you can't, you can't think about the things of God. And, and listen, who should be on the throne of your heart? Not some idol in your life. Not something that you want to magnify and, and are obsessed with in your life. Jesus Christ wants to be on the throne of your life. He is the one that has right to your life. Not anybody else, not anything else, but Jesus himself. Hebrews 4.13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. What man can't see, God can. What man can't see, God can. So what was the problem? There was no room for the real God. What's the solution? Well, you need to remove it and replace it. Remove it and replace it. Did you know that these idols did not bring real joy or life to God's people? Did you know that? They couldn't see, they couldn't hear, they couldn't speak, they couldn't touch. They were 
inanimate objects. They were stone, they were wood, they were, you know what I mean? It was like, and these are the things that, they, that God's people were bowing down and worshipping. You might not have that, but you have something. Now, let me do, this sounds really weird, all right? But I'll use myself as an example. This, it, it sounds weird and it's like, just listen for a minute. I, I, I love the outback. Love the bush. Man, I loved everything about it. I loved its open spaces. I loved, I loved the people out there. I loved the lifestyle. I loved the work. Trucks and motorbikes and horses and sheep and cattle and all of that. Did you know that that was my idol? Did you ride a horse? Yeah. I was four when I started riding. That was my idol. I had no room for, I was saved, but I had no room for Jesus. Because I was always thinking, wasn't I? You asked me what? I was always, that. it was on my mind. I was obsessed with that. I wanted to leave Adelaide. I wanted to go bush. I had enough. I wanted to go there. I wanted to, even, even today, I still think about it every now and again. And, and it's like, wow, you know. And then I think, well, how stupid was I? How stupid to want to give up a life for the Lord and go out in the bush? Stupid. But that was, that was life. But you know what? I, I can get as much, now get this, and you'll think I'm stupid for this, but I can get as much obsessed about trucks. Now get that. Tr I love machinery. I love big machinery. Trucks. Big camera. Man, I've driven all that sort of stuff. Man, a in gear, 600 horsepower, all that sort of stuff. King of the road, man. There's nothing, there is nothing better than cruising down the road in a big, flashy, shiny machine looking down on everybody. <laughs> Looking down <laughs> and putting the indicator on, no one wants to let you in, but you put that indicator on, you start to move over, they all back off. <laughs> That's power. <laughs> That's power. But you know what? Are you, you ask my wife, we'll be driving down the Bruce Highway, be like, you know? <laughs> but that can be an idol in my life. Sport could be an idol in my life. When I was first married, instead of Instead of really devoting, I'm burying my soul here, instead of devoting all my time to my life, do you know what I did on the weekends after working all week? I'd go out and play golf with my mates. That was an idol in my life. So it doesn't have to be something of a carved image or a, 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 a cement statue or anything like that. It could be anything in your life that you obsess over. More than obsessing over the things of God. Now, only you can put a name to that idol. See, only you and God can see what's in here and what's in here. And that's why if the Spirit of God says, hey, this, hey, this, you know what? You're better off getting things right and removing that and replacing it with the things of God, just like Josiah did. He went through all of Jerusalem, all of, all of uh, uh, Judea, and, and, he, and he purged everything. And you know what happened? And we'll see it as we continue on. They started replacing all of that idolatry with the things of God. And God just blessed abundantly. They replaced false worship with real worship. I want you to go to John chapter 6. We'll be done with this. John chapter 6. Listen, when you read through your Old Testament, don't just look at it and think, oh, that's Israel, that's Hebrew, that's the Jews, that was a different dispensation, that was a different covenant. All this. Listen, those things are for our learning. What I like about reading through the Old Testament is that you see what humanity is like and humanity has not changed. It hasn't changed all through the centuries. People are still the same. Unsaved, wicked people, they're still the same. And God's people are still the same. They're like this, up and down. We're, we've all been there. We've been on highs and we're walking with the Lord. Then we've been down here and we've been up here and we've been down there. Listen, we've all been there. So we can't look back on the lives of these people and say, oh, you're wicked, but all this sort of stuff. No, hang on a second. Let's search our own hearts. Search me, O God, and know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be any wicked way in me. If there's not, praise the Lord, then you've got freedom to worship and just praise God. But if there's idols in there, then there's no room for Jesus. John chapter 6, great chapter, wonderful chapter. 
Verse 59, these things saith he in the synagogue and taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can, who can hear it? Of course, he's talking about the Lord's Supper and he's telling them, you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood. <laughs> They're thinking, what cannibalism? What, what madness is it? It was a hard saying. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? See, sometimes the things that Jesus says offends his people. Come on, is that right? I've sat under preaching before and I've left offended. We all get offended. 62. What, what and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Now look at this. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Did you see that? See, the, the idols are no, there's no life, there's no, there's no blessing, there's, there's nothing in the idol itself. But Jesus is saying, listen, the words that I speak, they are spirit. It's the spirit that quickens. That's why we've got to be men and women of the book. And I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll say this, if you are a Christian, if you're a man or a lady and you're in your Bible, guess what's going to happen? When you come to a message like this, you're going to say, yes, that's right, because through the week you've been in your word and God has spoken to you day by day and you get things cleared up day by day so that when you come to church on a Sunday, you're free to worship. And when there's a hard message that's preached, when Jesus said something that may offend, instead of offending you, you get up and say, yes, that's right, Lord. Why is that? Because you've dealt with me with this throughout the week because your spirit quickens and the word gives life. So if we would be in the book Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, when we get to preaching time, we ought to be, amen, yes, that's right. But do you know what? Sometimes because we're not in the book, we hear a message where it's like, whoa, this is a hard saying. This is hard preaching. Why is that? Well, because we've not been in the, we've not been in the life all week. So we come to the end of the week and it's like, bang, bang, bang. I just, man, I got smacked around today at church and... Oh, man, I don't know if I can go back tonight and go for another round. You know, all that sort of stuff. We get beaten up, but there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's good. Sometimes when I go to a preaching conference, I want to be roughed up a little bit. I want to be roughed up. So Jesus said, it's the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. So what are we going to do? Well... As we've come to the beginning of the life of Josiah, we see that he had to remove some roadblocks. He had to remove some things in his life that was a hindrance to the, the outpouring of God's revival. So what's the question today? What is it that you have in your life that is a hindrance, that is a blockage to God reviving you? Doesn't matter what it is, you, you know, anything that's more important than the things of God. If there is anything that's more important in your life, and be honest, because remember last week I said revival starts with God's people being honest. Think, yeah, okay, yeah, there's some things there. And I need, to make, I need to make room for Jesus. Well, what you do is you remove that. But you've got to have, and this is, this is true replacement theology. God, God has not replaced Israel. This is true replacement theology. You remove the roadblocks and you replace it with the things of God. Because I tell you this, you only get true fulfillment from God himself, from the Lord Jesus Christ. You will find a temporary fulfillment in the things of this world, but it's only temporary. Satan is great at dangling the carrot. We were talking about fishing earlier on. Man, you throw that thing at Satan is good at doing that. And so from time to time, the Lord says, okay, you need to remove that and you need to replace it. So what is it this morning in your life that you need to remove and replace it with the things of God? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you. Thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. And Lord, I do pray that this message has been one that uh, your people would take to heart. And maybe there are some things that have been revealed in the hearts of your people this morning. And that they would be honest with you and say, yes, Lord, I need to remove that. And I need to replace it with the things of yourself. God, help us in these days, we pray. Lord, we want revival. 
but oftentimes we want it, but really, do we really want it? If we wanted it, we would remove some things. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd have your will and way in the service, in the song time now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's... Uh